My name is Justin Shubo. I'm president of the National Civic Arts Society. Uh, our organization, together with the Mid-Atlantic chapter of the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art, are very glad you could join us this evening to hear Professor James Stevens Curl speak about his new book, Making Dystopia, The Strange Rise and Survival of Architectural Barbarism. Founded in 2002, the National Civic Arts Society educates and empowers our leaders in the promotion of public art and architecture worthy of our great republic. We do so by advocating for the classical tradition in civic design. We believe that that tradition is unparalleled in its dignity, beauty, and harmony, not to mention its legibility to the common man. It is no accident that the founding fathers chose the classical style when designing the nation's capital and its core buildings of government. The founders sought to hearken back to Republican Rome and Democratic Athens, and they knew that classical architecture was time-honored and timeless. The National Civic Arts Society works to continue and expand upon the founders' vision for the nation's capital and federal design, but we also concern ourselves with the future of architecture more generally. For the reasons Professor Curl is going to lay out tonight, we maintain that contemporary architecture is, by and large, a failure. The public finds it's ugly, strange, and off-putting. It has created a built environment that is degraded and dehumanizing. The reason for this failure is the ideology of architectural modernism, which came to dominance after the Second World War and represented a complete rejection of the past. As Professor Curl powerfully shows in his book, modernism replaced the poetry of design with the spirit of mechanization, as embodied in the steel and glass box and brutalist concrete. The National Civic Arts Society endeavors to help architecture return to its pre-modernist roots, particularly the forms, principles, and standards of the classical tradition and the humanistic architectural idioms that are derived from it. To achieve such a return in a quite literal sense, we have been leading a campaign in New York City to rebuild the original Pennsylvania Station. Designed by McKim, Mead, and White and completed in 1910, the original train station was a Beaux-Arts masterpiece that equaled the majesty of Grand Central Terminal. In 1963, it was torn down and replaced by the current station. A hideous catacomb, it is the most hated train station in the country. <laughs> It is our goal to resurrect the original station in all its original glory. As the great urban planner Daniel Burnham said, make no little plans, they lack the magic to stir men's blood. Classicism, we believe, stirs men's blood and women's too. Modernism, by contrast, should make it boil. And with that, I'll turn it over to Stefan Hurry and the ICANA Mid-Atlantic. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Stephen Hurry, uh, representing the Mid-Atlantic Chapter of the ICAA. Um, we're very pleased to have um, Professor uh, James Stevens Curl with us tonight. He's visiting uh, on a tour of ICAA chapters throughout the United States. I think he's already been to New York and Philadelphia, and tomorrow we're, he's on his way to New Orleans, and then later Denver. Um, so we're happy to have him here visiting from County Downs in Northern Ireland, and um, he comes with a very impressive resume. Um, he's been a visiting fellow at Peter House Cambridge, is a member of the Royal a Irish Academy, a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries in London, and a fellow of the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland. His many publications include studies of classical Georgian and Victorian architecture, and his most recent edition of the Oxford Dictionary of Architecture was recently published. Um, he's here tonight to talk about his most recent book um, that we've already heard a little bit about, and we're about to hear much more. Um, and uh, lastly, in 2017, he was awarded the British Academy President's Medal for Outstanding Service to the Cause of Humanities and Social Sciences in his wider study of the history of architecture in Britain and Ireland. And I think we here probably have a lot to learn from him as well. So with no further ado, let's welcome uh, Professor Curl to the stage. Well, thank you very much, sir, and 
I'm delighted to be here. I was taken to task uh, with various Twitter accounts, etc., the usual cowardly attacks, uh, sneering that nobody knew where this came from. That means that they haven't read Pugin's Contrasts, one of the most important architectural books ever published, 1836, contrasting the architecture by the masters of his own day, the leaders of the profession, with the great works of the Middle Ages. His agenda were, of course, to restore Catholicism through architecture. But one of the things that's noticeable about this is that both the styles of architecture which he shows here uh, respond to gravity. They uh, are there giving a sense of stability through the orders of architecture in the classical tradition and through the piers, the pointed arches, the vaults, the buttresses, and so on, in what we mistakenly call Gothic. Now, Coventry Patmore, who was probably the greatest architectural critic of the 19th century, said that architecture succeeds if it suggests stability. As a column or a series of columns supporting uh, lintels, enlarged as entablatures, um, suggests, and also uh, the pointed arches with their systems of buttresses also suggests st stability. And if you don't have that sense of stability, and if you do not have uh, uh, geometries that, which make you feel at ease, the buildings uh, do not succeed as architecture. Now, classical architecture, arts and crafts, Victorian, Georgian, the architecture of the Middle Ages, can be found in places like the cathedral closes of uh, England, uh, where all those styles coexist quite happily and harmoniously. They do so through materials, through natural materials, and because the, their geometries all work together and suggest that stability to which I have referred. When I uh, did this drawing, which of course is based on Pugin, um, I uh, took my examples from a mixture of um, a pile of sandwiches, um, uh, deconstructivism, blobism, pilotes, subcorbusian blocks, and other familiar modernist elements masquerading as architecture weighed in the balance against a selection of classical works by people like John Nash, Robert Smirk, and others. I think it makes the point quite well, but a lot of people didn't get that either. Um, I'm delighted to say uh, I've annoyed a lot of people. Now, if we look at a typical street uh, of the 19th, late 19th century, early 20th century, we see a series of buildings which are all vertical in emphasis. This is the high street of Belfast, as it was, round about 1910, I imagine. And this is what it looks like now. The aggressive horizontals are well, absolutely compulsory, of course. We have undistinguished Neo-Georgian. The building on the left has lost its urns. If you look back, you can see the urns. Um, and the scale, of course, is completely up the spout. It dominates, it cuts across, it ignores. It's like a loutish intruder. Pevsner wrote that Art Nouveau really begins in the 1880s, and he saw it as, as a precursor of modernism. Uh, these uh, photographs show examples from the 1860s, 20 years earlier than Pevster insisted Art Nouveau began, and you see that, in fact, it develops from the Gothic revival. There are countless examples of a, a transition from late Gothic revival into early proto-Art Nouveau, and Pevster just got it absolutely wrong, as he did a lot of other things as well. <laughs> 
I used to get rather surprised when I was in full-time academe when essays used to come in from students suggesting that the Glasgow School of Art had absolutely no historicism or historical references in it whatsoever. I was amazed, so I assembled a series of photographs of the building, um, and I put them in front of them, and I said, look, what do you make of this? Stunned silence, because you've got Art Nouveau over the entrance, you've got a bay window from English vernacular cottages, you even have three tall windows to the library from a recent work by Sir Edwin Lutyens completed two years previously. So I said, what's all this nonsense about, there's absolutely no, nothing historical about it, it's just, uh, some, it suddenly appeared out of the air. And again, I said, you've been reading Pevsner uh, and you've regurgitated, and I said, you're looking with your ears. And that is the problem. People look with their ears. They read tripe and they look and they imagine it's all right. Well, it isn't. <laughs> Bailey Scott. Now, Bailey Scott was a great arts and crafts architect. This is the um, entrance hall of, of a great house at, uh, in the Lake District in England called Blackwell. And Pevsner suggested that he might be a, a pioneer of the modern movement. Bailey Scott wrote vitriolically about Gropius and all he stood for, and saying it just wasn't true. And those who have suggested that the atelier, uh, uh, which Corbusier did with Amédée aux Enfants in Paris uh, in the 1920s, was based upon Bailey Scott, I think uh, need help. Pevsner also wrote that Voisy, Charles uh, C.F.A. Voisy, was um, a pioneer of the modern movement. In his uh, Pioneers of the Modern Movement note from Walter Gropius, from William Morris to Walter Gropius, Voisy himself objected to this strongly, and he told Pevster that, please don't do this. I hate what you're suggesting that I have anything to do with. And Pevster went ahead and published it anyway. So that spurious history, this attempt to create a tabula rasa, and at the same time um, claim respectable ancestors, doesn't stand up to serious examination. It's just assiduous propaganda rather than history. It results not, not merely in untruths, but the opposite of the truth. Both William Morris and Voisy were claimed by apologists thereafter, apologists for modernism as progenitors of that movement. But this is fantastically unlikely to anyone with eyes to see, and was rejected uh, by Voisy. Morris, of course, was dead by then, but if he, he was a man of a ferocious temper, a mercurial uh, uh, temperament, and if he had heard anybody saying that, he would have gone up and punched them very hard between the eyes. <laughs> Among other things, of course, the modernism which Voisy detested was pitifully full of faults, and it was vulgarly aggressive. But Pevsner, who once called for architecture to become totalitarian, that's written, if you'll find the 1936 edition of Pioneers, it's there, insisted that Voisy was a precursor of modernism thus implying he knew much better than Voisy what his architecture was all about. Now, the widely accepted narrative of modernism a la Gropius is that it was some kind of logical or ineluctable development from the arts and crafts movement. Now, this seems to me to be utterly fantastic. It's like saying that Mickey Spillane is a logical or ineluctable outgrowth of Montesquieu. An, art, an artistic uh, product has surely to be assessed aesthetically on its own merits, which in architecture includes, must include harmony 
with the existing townscape, although the modernists specifically rejected that. And only someone who sees with an ideology rather than with eyes could conclude anything other than the modernism has been overwhelmingly a disaster, not just aesthetically, but socially as well. But claiming respectable ancestors is something at variance with equal claims to starting from zero, as Gropius put it. But such a contradiction is hardly noticed in these grand narratives which Pevsner and others have constructed. Hendrik, oh, sorry, I'm just a bit, yes, that's, I went too far ahead. Um, H.P. Berlacher, the great Dutch architect, his uh, merchant's uh, exchange in Amsterdam has also been falsely claimed as a pioneer of the modern movement. Well, look at the traditional brick structure, the traditional brick vaulting, the um, free allusions to Romanesque, to Dutch vernacular architecture, and the use of the iron and glass roof drawing on industrial buildings of some 60, 70 years earlier. Berlacher went to the first congress of CIAM, refused to have his photograph taken with the others, sat outside drawing the medieval chateau, and said to all the delegates, you are ruining everything I've spent my life working on. I refuse to have anything to do with you. You are a disgrace. So let's look at the unholy trinity of architectural modernism. Uh, Walter Gropius, Ludwig Mies, and Le Corbusier, as he called himself. These were human beings so flawed that between them they were really an encyclopedia of human vice. They spoke of morality, and they behaved like whores. They talked of the masses, they were egotists. They claimed to be principled, and they were without scruple, either moral, intellectual, aesthetic, or financial. Their two undoubted talents were those of self-promotion and survival, combined with an overweening thirst for power and influence. Their intellectual dishonesty was startling and would have been laughable had it not been more uh, destructive than the Luftwaffe uh, eventually turned out to be. When they claimed to have no style because the designs were imposed on them by history, uh, technology, social necessity, functionality, economy, etc., and like Luther proclaimed they could do no other, which soon became the demand that nobody else could do so either. They remind uh, me of the logical uh, positivists who claim to have no interest in metaphysics. In like manner, modernists became adept at claiming both that their architecture was a logical development and uh, development of, and an aesthetic successor of classical Greek architecture, utterly new and utter unprecedented at the same time. Well, you can't have both. They created buildings uh, that not only in theory, but in actual practice, were incompatible with all that had gone before, and intentionally so. If you look at the um, drawing on the right, Louis Hellman's wonderful cartoon of a whole lot of dim architects claiming their, hailing their deity as he comes down from heaven, and the Parthenon in the background. The drivel which uh, Corbusier wrote about the Parthenon is unbelievable. His books are littered with references to the Parthenon and other monuments, but how anybody can see anything in common between the Parthenon and his ideas defeats me. Let's just look at what some of these people were doing. Um, Gropius couldn't draw. He always worked with somebody else. For many years, he worked with Adolf Meyer. And the building on the left is a proposal for a monument to Bismarck by Gropius and Meyer 
from 1910. And on the right, the two pictures are uh, entries for the same competition to Bismarck by Ludwig Mies. Note, I don't use the word van der Rohe, because Mies in German means something that is rather nasty, uh, shabby, unpleasant. Now, the language of architecture used by uh, Gropius, Meyer, and Ludwig Mies, I think, is very similar to that proposed by Wilhelm Kreis for the monuments to German soldiers to be erected all over Europe after Germany had conquered the world in 1941. These ideas were endemic. Some of the stylistic examples come from Peter Behrens's stable, from his office, where they both worked. The crematorium at Delston, uh, at Hagen, Del Del Delston by Hagen in North Rhine-Westfalen, uh, by Behrens, shows certain affinities with the long colonnades of Queen Hatshepsut's temple at Deir al-Bahari in Egypt, dating from uh, something like uh, 1500 BC, as does the exhibition uh, uh, um, pavilion for the um, cement and chalk industry at Berlin Treptow in 1910 by, by Behrens. And that stripped classicism can also be found in Behrens's design for the Imperial German Embassy in St. Petersburg, uh, you could see that the, the um, uh, sculpture has been removed from it uh, up above. And you'll notice the long, elongated, uh, engaged columns, uh, a style of stripped classicism that is maintained well into the next few decades of the 20th century. The job architect was Ludwig Mies. Ludwig Mies, when he went out on his own as a practitioner, produced buildings that were derived from the classicism of Prussia or from loosely from the arts and crafts period. And he subsequently uh, produced exhibition drawings for these that he hoped would make him uh, firmly established in architectural circles in Germany. There was another architect working at the time in Germany, um, Hans Pulzig, whose work was mostly in Breslau, which is now Wrocław in Poland. These are two surviving buildings of his, uh, an office block on the left, and part of the exhibition buildings for the 1913 exhibition to celebrate the victory of Germany uh, over Napoleon at the Battle of Leipzig. They were also helped by the Prussians and the Austrians, the Russians and the Austrians. And the building that you see with its stripped uh, Doric columns is entirely of concrete, as is the building on the left, the office block. You'll notice that the strip windows are mitigated to some extent by the verticals which help to support the floors between them. Meanwhile, um, Gropius, working with Adolf Meyer, produced a number of buildings before the First War, including the celebrated um, Werkbund exhibition building, which draws on ancient Egyptian architecture. If you compare the two plans, the Ptolemaic temple on the left and the Gropius Maya plan on the right it mixes Egyptianizing elements and also in the office block um, themes from the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. It's interesting that there was a big exhibition of Egyptian temples in Berlin uh, around about this time, and there was, of course, the publication of the great Vasmut uh, edition of Frank Lloyd Wright's work. Now, after 1918, I think it's fair to say that Germany became a basket case. Uh, the whole discredited monarchical system was replaced by um, 
an extreme left-wing movement in artistic circles uh, to which Gropius and others adhered in the Workers' Council for Art and so on and so, on, so, so forth. There were armed gangs in the streets, uh, revolutionary groups, but there were also dozens of mystical associations of spiritualists, uh, Blavatskyists, and so on and so forth. And part of the architectural movement of the time was, began to be controlled by that uh, preeminent politician, Walter Gropius. Ludwig Mies submitted designs and was told that his work was unacceptable because it was reactionary and full of historicism. He changed his name to Mies, adding an umlaut on the E, which therefore has no unfortunate connotations, and added van der Rohe, which sounds vaguely grand as, we, as well as being reassuringly Dutch. Meanwhile, Gropius, having been disbanded, uh, took up his post as director of the uh, various art schools in Weimar, which he renamed the Bauhaus, the building house. And he claimed that therein it would be a, a place where all the arts would be reunited, which would be based on the, the cathedral uh, lodges of the Middle Ages, and which would be rational and scientific. None of that is true. These are two of his appointees, rationalist and modernist, you can see. Gustav Nagel, who abolished the capital letter, which is very difficult in Germany because all nouns have got capital letters. <laughs> and Johannes Itten, whom you see on the right in his fetching modern dress, who insisted in his, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in his initial co uh, um, course uh, that every student should have an enema and eat uh, a garlic paste. Now, in a Germany that was bankrupt, in some cases starving, enemas and garlic pastes were perhaps not the best way of beginning. <laughs> but, but very quickly, very quickly, the Bauhaus established itself as a place where a pseudo-religious cult was involved. And it is that cult which has informed things ever since. So what is a dangerous cult? It's a kind of false religion. It's a system of belief based on assertions with no factual foundations. It's an excessive, almost idolatrous admiration for a person, for persons, or ideas, or even a fad. The adulation accorded to Le Corbusier, um, given the status of a deity in architectural circles, is just one example. It has certain characteris characteristics which might be summarized uh, thus. It's destructive. It isolates its believers. It claims superior but spurious knowledge and morality. It demands subservience, conformity, and obedience. It's adept at brainwashing. It imposes its own assertions as dogma. And it will not countenance any dissent whatsoever. Furthermore, it's self-referential. Its tame intellectuals are brought on board to construct a grand narrative tailored to suit the story, that is, to create a bogus history to convince the dim. And it invents its own arcane language, incomprehensible to outsiders. And I think that anybody unfamiliar with the workings within architectural s schools who might feel that the above overstates the case should attend a crit. The new Mies van der Rohe conformed to the demand to produce a design for an office block, the ancestor of numerous uh, thereafter. A building uh, which, with, with solid sitting on glass, which immediately creates a sense of unease. One feels the whole thing could go collapse. <laughs> 
And Mendelssohn was doing the same sort of thing. He erected that example you see on the right in the Potsdamer Platz. Meanwhile, both um, Mies van der Rohe and Walter Gropius identifying themselves with uh, socialism uh, uh, produced these two monuments, uh, one to workers who had been shot during the Kapp Lutwitz Putsch in Weimar in 1921, and Mies van der Rohe, the monument to the murdered communists Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, whose bodies were thrown into the Landwehr Canal during the Spartacus uprising. Now, if you design uh, things like this, you're going to identify yourself very firmly with communist views. And that's precisely what happened. The Dutch modernists hated the Weimar thing. They said it was a, a, a cheap idea. And the problem is, of course, it could just as easily have commemorated the Kapp Lutwitz troops who shot them. And this brings me to the point of meaning. The impoverished language of modernism removed meaning from architecture. Gropius, under pressure from the tradesmen of Weimar who got fed up with um, students playing games and singing songs to tractors, moved, moved to Dessau, which was ru ruled by the Social Democrats. And there, with others, he created typical um, houses um, uh, obeying his dicta. And you can see the results of a fairly recent photograph on the right. Now, contrary to popular belief, Gropius hardly designed anything. Everything, the Bauhaus, for example, is always credited to, Bo ba to Gropius. But in fact, the architects who, whose six signatures are on the drawing are Karl Fieger and Ernst Neufert. They don't get any credit for it, uh, perhaps because um, Fieger had worked on the interiors of the Imperial Embassy at St. Petersburg for Barons, and Neufert subsequently rose to complete, uh, to great eminence through the influence of Albert Speer under National Socialist Germany. But the Bauhaus became a kind of holy grail of modernism. Meanwhile, in France, uh, Charles Edouard Jeanneret had reinvented himself as Le Corbusier, like other um, dictators, Stalin, Lenin, Molotov, and produced this. Uh, a, I think a sh shot over shot. Uh, there we are. Uh, a plan for um, Paris. Um, destroying Paris virtually from the back of the Louvre. You see the Louvre in the bottom left-hand corner there, uh, f really from the river right up to Montmartre, uh, replacing it with a series of um, skyscrapers. And this, the drawing on the right uh, suggests that the whole of the ground has to be handed over to motor vehicles. The uh, human being is driven underground. This was very ominous because it, in fact, became the model for what was to be all too true virtually everywhere. And if you look at a typical drawing of the Corbusian uh, ideal plan and Louis Hellman's vision of what it really turned out to be, with great notice, this is hell, get us out of here, and all the graffiti and rubbish and used syringes and God knows what else. Corbusier also was very good at doctoring the truth. He published the image, the lower image there, claiming it was a Canadian grain uh, elevator, but he also brushed out the pitched roofs because they didn't suit his propaganda. 
rather like those photographs of the Politburo from which somebody has been liquidated that used to be a PMP. And he also obsessed about ocean-going liners of the Titanic vintage and the modernity of uh, modern French bombers. And you can see the long horizontal window, the portholes, the um, nautical ventilators and so on on the ship that he illustrated in his uh, towards um, a new architecture, or towards an architecture as it was originally in French. And the uh, French bomber, the Farman uh, Goliath bomber, uh, with its struts and, and pilotti, the, after the, this thin uprights which he adopted, and the, the struts and ties, which also are regurgitated in buildings such as the Pompidou Center some years later. If you look at his, his uh, much vaunted um, Villa Savoie, you'll see those pilotti. You'll see the strip windows and the vaguely nautical stuff going on uh, above the roof. Now, Corb Corbusier, you may know, was a fascist in the most literal sense of the word. And early during the occupation, he advocated the removal by force of the majority of Paris's population because it had no business to be living there. Now, this kind of megalomania, uh, this, 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 this insistence on power, uh, this should have been spotted in advance as an aesthetic and moral catastrophe. And I've, just, I've attempted to describe that in my book. And the rapid rise and complete triumph of modernism throughout the world, so that an office block in Caracas should be no different from one in Bombay or Johannesburg, is very mysterious to some, but I do, in fact, suggest a means by which it happened. By the late 1920s, Gropius, Mies, and others were in more or less complete dictatorial control and were able to build an exhibition uh, outside Stuttgart called the White House um, Siedlung, or Housing District where various architects uh, contributed, all in the, that same white style with horizontal windows, pilotti, and so on and so forth. The building on the right is by Corbusier, the building on the left by Mies van der Rohe. Now, this um, attempt to suggest there was only one thing, one way in which something could be done, with no decoration, you'll notice, no natural decoration as there is in classicism or in Gothic. This is the first time in the history of mankind that no decoration appears as an integral part of architecture. You find absurdities like allow provisional sum of so many thousand dollars for art to be bolted on a concrete wall later. That's not an integral part of anything. There were there was also a coercion to it. You have to do this. This is moral. This is rational. And of course, it is none of, nothing of the sort. And the resistance came in strange places. It came, for example, in England from Buggers Baroque. This was uh, a suggestion by various uh, people, such as Osbert Lancaster, that uh, a sort of high camp style uh, would, would, be, would relieve us from uh, this dictatorship that was being um, imposed. I rather like the photograph of Stephen Tennant languorously draped on his bed. But it was Osbert Lancaster, I think, who really got the thing absolutely bang on. He did this wonderful drawing of a typical national socialist building with swastika and eagle, two stormtroopers, heroic male and female figures, stripped, the stripped elongated Doric columns as used by, at the um, Imperial Embassy, and the other version for the Soviet Union with a couple of guards, equally muscular people, but you will notice that the capitals have been removed from the columns for ideological reasons. 
Meanwhile, we're always told that um, Gropius and Mies, as he's so fondly referred to in the West, left Germany as soon as the National Socialists came to power. Well, they didn't. Um, these are competitions for the Reichsbank in Berlin, one by Gropius et al, and the other by Mies van der Rohe. Not, they're both, as you can see, in a, an international modernist glazed style. Everybody seems to think that national, in National Socialist Germany, there was only one style of life. That's not true. In fact, that factory, which you see in the upper picture, is just about as modernist as you could find anywhere. It's 1935 to 6 by Wimpel and Bernard. Mm -hmm. For more, uh, for government buildings and for show buildings, a strict classicism was very much uh, the vogue. For example, the, the great uh, 1936 Olympic Stadium by Werner Mark. But if you look at the truth, you'll see that for uh, autobahn stations, for factories and so on. <laughs> Modernism was ubiquitous in National Socialist Germany. In other words, there was choice. Just as there was choice in workers' housing, there's buildings in the Franconian timber frame style or by Albert Speer. And the buildings at the bottom uh, with a pitched roof, actually, on top of a building that was originally designed with a flat roof, and the um, statue of the worker, which doesn't look particularly right-wing to me. Anyway, uh, we have, I think, a, a great variety of choice in National Socialist Germany, but even so, uh, the Bauhäusler, who were associated with monuments such as the one in Weimar, which I showed you, and with the Luxembourg Liebknecht monument, were not exactly going to make themselves popular. And it was Mies himself who shut the Bauhaus, not the National Socialists themselves. Gropius had chums in England who invited him over in 1934. There's a portrait of Gropius by Max Ernst, which I think tells me quite a lot. And very soon, uh, Gropius and Maxwell Fry um, designed these blocks of apartments overlooking w w w Windsor Castle. Uh, we are told in the public prints of the time that the world was not ready for it. I don't, I, I don't think King George V was either. <laughs> The strange thing about Gropius, as I've indicated before, is that nearly all his lauded buildings were produced with others, or largely by others. And at first he was in partnership with um, Adolf Meyer, with the celebrated shoe last factory at Alfeld and a liner, and of course the, the um, Werkbund exhibition building. And I've mentioned Karl Fieger, and uh, Ernst Neufert, their importance in the buildings at Dessau of the Bauhaus. The fact is, Gropius was not a great architect. As I've said, he was an enabler. He was an inferential theorist. He was a pedagogue. But his writings, for example, the scope of total architecture, based on articles and lectures he had written, uh, from 1937 onwards, if perused with clear eyes and unclouded brain, do not really live up to his inflated reputation. So what happened? Well, he was very fortunate in that he had enthusiastic American supporters, um, Alfred Barr and William uh, Philip Johnson who organized that exhibition with Henry Russell Hitchcock and Lewis Mumford, the international style from which any building which did not conform was excised. So having flirted with communism and with batty cults after 1918, like many others in a ruined Germany, Gropius and other Bauhäusler ended up in America in the 1930s,
where through the influence of people like Alfred Bauer and Philip Johnson, they were placed in powerful positions in architectural establishments. But Sybil Mahole Nage, who should have known all about it, was to write that the browbeating symbolism, and I'm quoting from her, the browbeating symbolism of a negative ideology was clearly bankrupt when Hitler shook the tree and America picked up the poisoned fruit. This lethal harvest was so-called functionalism, which was not about function at all, but was solely concerned with packaging. And its seed was widely scattered by the Bauhäusler, including Gropius. American converts embraced the tenets of Gropius und Gesellschaft, which wreaked healthy, which wrecked rather, a, a healthy American architecture and civic design. This catastrophe she called Hitler's revenge. I think that's a very important thing when you consider that one of the greatest of all American architectural works, Pennsylvania Railway Station uh, in New York, which was a masterpiece of ennobled architecture, engineering, and organization that put the dismal products of Gropius-influenced modernism to shame, was demolished, but Gropius was keen that what he described as a monument to a particularly insignificant period in American architectural history, a case of pseudo-tradition, should cease to exist, probably because it showed up the shoddiness of the modernism he had tirelessly promoted. And also, Gropius was involved in London with Jack Cotton in the proposed redevelopment of London's Piccadilly Circus, which would have been one of the crassest of ham-fistedly ugly schemes ever inflicted on the capital, but fortunately was never implemented. As the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography observes, Cotton's most enduring monuments are eyesores. So what was Mies van der Rohe doing all this time? Well, he was signing in 1934 with other architects a proclamation supporting Hitler in his assumption of supreme power. After Mies van der Rohe eventually accepted a job in America, he was very miffed that Gropius had been invited uh, and not him first. He wrote a letter to the Prussian Academy of Arts, and you see at the top, the, the headings uh, has the, the umlaut on the E, as I've described, and he ends the letter, Heil Hitler. During the war, Le Corbusier collaborated with the hated Vichy regime, and then invented humanity again with his modular man for his so-called unité d'habitation. Um, with its internal streets, um, which are rather inviting, especially when the lights go out and the place fills with smoke. Now, the crassest thing about all this is that this image was copied mindlessly. It was copied mindlessly uh, from uh, Unité, like the one in Marseille, or B.A. Uh, on, on Forêt, the... the, the, the um, the B.A. en Forêt is one of my own drawings on the right. I have omitted to show the tin cans and other detritus lying around the bottom. But when the, 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 the thing is virtually copied and repeated in a housing estate in London, and the results are described as picturesque, like an 18th century landscape garden, one begins to wonder if the whole world has gone mad. We are asked to believe this. Again, Osbert Lancaster got it right. This is an English town the modernists have got at. You can see that the uh, part of the medieval abbey is now marooned on a traffic roundabout. 
The parish church has lost its graveyard. We can't have any reminders of death, so untidy, my dear. And the working classes are shoved on stilts, pilotti, and have to walk on high-level walkways to get anywhere because the whole of the ground has been given up to speeding cars. Now, I wonder about corporate corruption. You see, the moving by car unimpeded was a sort of proxy measure of efficiency, wealth, and modernity. Roads became more important than houses, streets, or amenities. What happened, or what seems to have happened, was that the Bauhäusler and other emigres could hardly believe their luck, because at the end of the Second World War, the architecture of stripped classicism, which was associated both with the Soviet Union, which was rapidly becoming the enemy, and also with National Socialist Germany, and to a certain extent with uh, Mussolini, who incidentally was an extreme left-wing socialist. When all that happened, and uh, uh, bodies such as uh, General Motors had been promoted through exhibitions, uh, a, a vision of a new world advocating uh, roads, widespread demolition roads smashing through areas, they got it made into legislation. And suddenly, the modernists, the, the emigres, found that they were gurus running the show as their ideas were re-exported, not only to Europe, but to the rest of the world, at this time associated with democracy. In England, which is probably the, well, it's not just England, it's the British Isles, um, the post-war world seemed to call for total destruction. But the thing is that many of the people who were modernists had been planning to destroy places like Coventry before the Luftwaffe conveniently did it for them. Those plans for precincts, high-rise, and so on and so forth all existed in 1939. They wanted every, to pull everything down and start again, even contemplating the total destruction of Bath, probably one of the most perfect Georgian cities. And much which could have been restored was demolished with glee. The planners and the architects involved thought they were rational because they planned so many cubic meters of living space and so many amenities per person, forgetting man does not live by cubic meters alone. They forgot. They combined the bureaucrat's lack of imagination with the tyrant's thirst for power. Never in world history had such technical incompetence been so powerfully allied with such total aesthetic insensitivity. And this led me to conclude that, in fact, the modern movement, as practiced, desensitized people. They could no longer see. They were browbeaten. And this became particularly true in Glasgow, which committed suicide. It pulled down solidly built great stone building, classical buildings and replaced them with this. Most of this has had to be demolished because nobody wants to live in it. They attacked it. If you compare the, what used to be called the Stalin Allee, now the Karl Marx Allee in East Berlin, which re-embraced the street and applied the so-called 16 principles of urbanism, which, when you read it, is actually quite sensible, the people who involved in the redevelopment of flattened Berlin in the East were Richard Paulik, Edward Collin, and other uh, people who were trained at the Bauhaus. They had no difficulty in serving one regime or another. Whereas in the Hadzaviertel in West Berlin, we have typical modernist tower blocks set in parkland. Which is better? <laughs> 
Rossi and Philip Johnson thought East Berlin far better. And then when we get disasters like these, like the destruction of Pruitt Ego, the typical CIA-inspired housing estate, which just didn't work, which was a, a nightmare. And also the curious thing that because we have modernism forgot about metaphysics, forgot about symbols, forgot about forgot that symbols are not the same as allegories. So there's a theological aspect to this. What did the Twin Towers actually mean? Well, they mean certain things to certain people, but f some people don't realize that the man who led the attack was a graduate architect from Hamburg who hated what the West had done to Aleppo. In Britain, we had the tabula rasa applied with great ferocity. We also had modernist crescents insultingly named after distinguished architects such as Robert Adam, Charles Barry, William Kent, and John Nash. These crescents, um, with their unkempt landscapes, were completed in 1971. But in less than 10 years, they had become one of the most dysfunctional housing estates in all Europe and have had to be demolished. That has been repeated everywhere. So if you look at the top right hand uh, picture, you'll see a, a rather forlorn Queen Anne house marooned in a dystopian wilderness with a sub mesian block r rising up behind it at the usual grot. I jokingly produced this little scribble and somebody said, what on earth is that in the middle? I said, it's a monument of thanksgiving for deliverance from the plague of modernism. <laughs> and when we look at yet another building from National Socialist German Workers' Party country, a factory from the 1930s, and we look at the uh, Smithson, uh, Smithton High School by the Smithsons, in Norfolk, a building which um, moved so much when the sun came out that all the glass cracked <laughs> and was so hot on one side that the, the children couldn't use it. And when the winter came, they couldn't use it either because they froze, they either baked or they, they froze. And this was called new brutalism. <laughs> Why? Peter Smithson's nickname was Brutus. He worked with his wife, Alison. So, brut ali sm, brutalism. Really. Uh, the building, of course, is listed now. And, uh, now, the former city terminus hotel in Cannon Street in London, which was designed by E.M. Barry. Uh, was demolished and replaced uh, by that bland curtain wall slab, which you see to the right of the <coughs> uh, of the Arab building. Now that uh, building in itself has also been demolished. It was designed by the infamous John Polson, who at the time had the biggest practice in Europe. He got his jobs by greasing the palms of everybody. Brown envelopes galore, galore stuffed with used notes. Even cabinet ministers. He and his associates ended up in jail, but not before they had virtually wrecked about 20 towns in England and done, done Im immeasurable damage. The Smithsons also designed this office block, uh, no, this uh, housing block at Robin Hood Gardens in Tower Hamlets in London on a horrible site. Um, hugely admired because it's by the Smithsons. It too has had to be demolished because it leaked, it creaked, nobody wanted to live there. And when Stanley Kubrick made the film A Clockwork Orange, he didn't need to have sets built for it. <laughs> he got the 
Greater London Council Architects Department to do it for him. <laughs> so we have the, the usual high-level walkways, which of course are very useful for mugging people on their way home in the dark. <laughs> and I, 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 it's not a joke. I mean, this is the kind of horror that has been inflicted at vast expense and is now being demolished. And now, after international modernism has been abandoned, and this is one thing I, I, I always laugh when I think of Philip Johnson being an international modernist, and everybody follows suit, and then he changes direction, and then they have to all follow him. And then he changes direction again, and they don't know what to do, and they all have nervous breakdowns, yet they have to change. I think it's very funny. But it shows the bankruptcy, the intellectual emptiness of it all. And now, what on earth do we have now with this kind of thing? Um, the, the deeply impoverished language of the Bauhaus or the Corbusian architecture. Even the most obtuse professional group in the world could see it was over. But when they turned away from the dreariness of, of uh, Corbusianity and others, this has hardly improved matters. We've, we've now discovered the delights for ourselves of originality without the discipline of even a reduced vernacular or reduced scholarship, giving buildings outlandish shapes um, simply because it's possible to do so using computers. And the more outlandish, the, most, the more attention is drawn uh, to the people who perpetrate it. And we have more of the same vast expense one wonders where this sort of thing will end. Have we had not had enough of it? Especially when even the Chinese, who have got this uh, large cool house building inflicted from, they, they call it the big underpants. Um, but I, I love Louis Hellman's interpretation, uh, the take on his interventions. Radical revolutionary Ram Killhouse has designed a landmark signature building for the city, and I think that sums it all up, St. Swindles Lane. But there's a very dark side to all this. We now have money bags, we have obscenely expensive buildings, we have architects collecting millions, stratospherically remote from what most people want or have inflicted upon them. And when you think that something like this could happen, from a 17th century interpretation of the Temple of Solomon, which you'll see on the top left, to an interpretation as a murder camp, and the reality of existence minimum with one latrine for 7,000 inhabitants and the crematoria roaring day and night. Don't forget that the architect of some of the worst buildings in Auschwitz-Birkenau was a graduate of, guess where, the Bauhaus. Building failures are endemic. These are two London examples. Uh, Ronan Point in Canning Town, which just fell down without warning. Lousy construction system. We have to have systems building, said Gropius. It all has to be factory made. Well, if, it's, if the design's no good, you get that sort of thing. And then when it's so ugly, you then have to clad a building. And you clad it with something that goes on fire so that everybody inside gets cremated. And that's what happened very recently in London. But modernist architecture, despite its patent failure, still has its defenders, especially in the purlieus of architectural schools. The population has been browbeaten into believing there was never any alternative. And it's obvious that to undo the damage would take decades, if not centuries. It would also be very expensive. Removing the Montparnasse Tower alone, which my Lord Foster seems to want to view from his proposed uh, viewing platform on Notre Dame Cathedral. Uh, this would probably cost several billion. No one's prepared to make this colossal effort. 
Walter Godfrey wrote in 1954, it's not an exaggeration to say that nine men out of 10 have lost all sensitiveness to an art that was once a matter of common interest, and there's no art which should be of more common interest than architecture. And if this is true, it's because they've learned to accept or swallow what they're given. The rashes of graffiti suggest to me that, at least subliminally, men uh, do take notice of their surroundings and are affected by them. Defacement is overwhelming of hideous Corbusian surfaces. That's to say what Corbusier called my friendly concrete. And I wonder about secularism and the growth, the growth of um, the decline of religious sentiment. Perhaps this has favored the meretricious. Modernism was, as I've suggested from the very first, a cult to substitute religion, but one with political nous, such that uh, it's insinuated its believers into architectural schools and architectural publications. Modernists and their praise singers, such as Pevsner, instituted a kind of intellectual reign of terror, which those did not share, um, which those who did not share were regarded as reactionary bumpkins or worse. Christian Morgenstern wrote a poem called The Fence, Der Lattenzaun, in the 1920s. Um, es war einmal ein Lattenzaun. It could be translated thus, once there was a fence whose failings numbered spaces and straight palings. A modernist who observed this site with stealth approached it in the night and pinched the spaces from the fence and with them built a residence. The fence, meanwhile, felt somewhat mean with rails but nothing in between. So as the fence had had its day, the council took the thing away. The architect went off, hey-ho, to Afri or America. And I end with this vision of horror through the window. I have tired of ringing the toxin, the bell, warning people. I have died in my chair. But death comes as a friend to continue ringing the warning. Perhaps it's time we all woke up. Thank you very much. Uh, the connections you've shown between um, communism and and uh, Nazism and modernism uh, were very interesting. But you know, there's also the curious phenomenon that the reverse happened. That you know, Saint Petersburg, they kept an academy of architecture there that until today is still teaching traditional architecture, and um, the art academies were still teaching traditional art. So that that goes against uh, there being necessarily a lockstep between uh, totalitarianism and um, and modernism. Does it not? Uh, yes, well, I think that it's very interesting that uh, in, uh, in, in uh, communist countries such as Poland, um, the techniques of conservation were kept alive. Uh, there's a huge difference, though, between what happened in, in um, places like Poland and even in Germany after the war, because the reconstruction of Polish cities was seen as part of the restoration of national character, national identity, if you like, after such massive destruction. And if you go to Nuremberg, the reconstruction work there still makes it feel like an old city yet again, although it was very badly flattened. Um, there was an awful lot pulled down, though, under the Soviet Union. However, the for some reason, I think Lenin himself cautioned against the destruction of some of the monuments, um, especially the palaces, and therefore they needed people to do the work. And so this, there was this, this uh, uh, aspect. But there was another very important aspect to all this, that until 1930, I think, 
six or seven um, until 1936, yes. Uh, modernism in the Bauhaus Western sense was regarded as bourgeois, uh, reactionary uh, revanchism, so it was discouraged. But when they got down to doing modernism in the 50s, their results were even viler than ours, I think. Uh, excellent, thank you. Um, can you give us a little bit um, more granularity on, remember the, the, one of the, your first slides, you have this town with the steeple and all the buildings are vertical and then the next one, everything is horizontal. What is it about this horizontal nature that you could tell us more about? Well, it cuts, it cuts, it deliberately cuts across the established vertical geometry. And because it was a hallmark of modernism from the time Mies van der Rohe produced his design in the early 1920s, and Eric Mendelssohn then did it at various department stores, um, it was a foreign element. It did not fit, you don't find that sort of thing, but it was deliberately done like so much else, like the bulky box, which destroys the very fabric of the geometry of a building. And also there's another uh, problem with this, and that is that um, I remember Rainer Bannum uh, uh, saying that uh, the facade doesn't matter. Once you get the plan right, the, the facade will take care of itself. That's probably why everything looks so awful. Yeah. If, you, if you don't spend any effort on the facade, it will just happen. Well, it's going to be a disaster. Yes, yes, madam. I'll come back, come back to you in a minute. When you were talking about um, people kind of buying into some of this modernism, do you think that's solely about the people who are selling the idea or about the kind of mentality of the people at that time? Or do you think it's just sort of the perfect storm of those two things? Because it kind of seems like it's applying now. And I'm wondering if it's where we are, or if it's just that there's really good people out there who are in tune to people being vulnerable to ideas? I think, I think there weren't many ideas around when it was first promulgated. And don't forget, it was imposed by force. It was a, it was a bullying um, organization. And it wasn't, it was backed up, with, the trouble is it was backed up with, with spurious arguments. I don't actually think, I think it was really all about getting something to look like something that might suggest functionalism or mechanization. But of course, it didn't, when you look at it carefully, it didn't do either. And though it, was, it was accepted by a kind of Politburo, which is what CIM was, which imposed itself on virtually every country in the world. It was it was it was uh, done using similar met methods to those used by the communists to spread ideo ideology, um, and then it was backed up by these long spurious narratives by people like Pevsner and Gideon and others. They don't really stand up to serious examination, and I tried to dissect them. Is that will that do? I would love to hear you dissect the modern era of architecture and design. Well, <laughs> it would take, take, take quite a long time. I think somebody down here. You. Um, can everyone hear me? Um, so I was wondering what your definition of beauty is and if that def beauty, beauty, ah, and yes. if that definition has changed over your career, and perhaps is it contingent on other philosophers or thinkers? Well, beauty was a word which was expunged from modernism altogether. You weren't allowed to use it. Uh, I've, uh, you, you, everybody said, "Oh, well, beauty is relative." Um, I think that architectural beauty is, uh, as Coventry. Patmore suggested, to do with how it responds to gravity and therefore looks stable. I think that's half the battle. Um, also, I think that uh, 
when ornament was an integral part of architecture and not stuck on, it contributed to beauty. I cannot for the life of me understand why in America you had the finest tradition of Beaux-Arts classicism in the work of John Russell Pope, um, uh, Burnham and uh, McKim Mead and White and all these, these marvelous people. And also landscape traditions as in your great cemeteries of Greenwood and so on. And you threw it all overboard for a group of charlatans. Why? And I think it's because of bullying and browbeating and the suggestion that this is something to do with progress. Now, let me remind you what Baudelaire said about progress. It's a doctrine of idlers and Belgians. <laughs> so I think beauty is to do with stability and geometry and respect for context and a sense that something has been created with hands. And therefore, I suggest that maybe the crafts have something to do with this. Yes? Yes? Um, does utility, is that of any concern to the beauty of architecture? Oh, yes, of course. It, of course it has to work. But to describe something as functional when it clearly isn't, is, is that's, that's, that's where a lot of the problem arises. But what the building is used for, perhaps? Yes, yes, what the building is used for, yes, yes, indeed. And the Penn Station was a wonderful amalgamation of use. It worked, it was, it was, it was a grand entrance to, to something, and it was a splendid piece of civic architecture as well, and, but it worked. Sorry, so there was somebody, ah, right. I was just going to ask if you're uh, an acquaintance with Roger Scruton. Y yes. And uh, if you have any comments on his dismissal from the... Yes, well, this, this is part of the bullying that's got going on now. Um, I was uh, the, yes, Scruton unwisely allowed himself to be interviewed by the new statesman, which nobody in his right mind would actually uh, cons uh, be concerned with. And also, if you, if you, if you were um, interviewed by the New Statesman, you should really keep a tape recorder on you. But the, the problem is that the, there's a technique used by bullies, taking remarks completely out of context and then spreading them through tweeting and all this sort of thing. And then some terrified politicians pick this up and say, oh, this man has to go without looking at the evidence. We have the most contemptible collection of politicians in power now that I've ever known. And such cowardice and just, just to follow the mob is very dangerous. I'm terrified of mobs, but we've got them in control now. Thank you, this is wonderful. Um, just to take maybe a subtext and make it text and ask you about the future and the road to restoration, healing, and the good. Um, it seems to me there's, th there's three options. There's a kind of Epicurean appeal to what's pleasant and sort of naturally accommodating to our daily lives, a kind of praxis argument. There's a philosophical argument about our stable nature, uh, the sort of a top-down argument. And then there's deep in the background a kind of theological argument of we want to you know, honor God and do these high, beautiful, vertical things. Do, do you see a particular prudence in focusing on one or the other or some uh, combination in terms of how do we how do we move our world culture, our national culture, our Anglosphere um, towards beautiful architecture again? I think it's going to be extremely difficult and a very uphill battle. Whether it's accomplishable or not, I don't know. 
But I think something's got to be done because otherwise I think there's going to be complete social breakdown. And I think it's not, I'm not really, I'm not advocating any one religion or another. What I'm suggesting is that a spiritual aspect in architectural design seems to have been largely discarded. I also think that the craft side of architecture and building has been ditched for the most part, apart from certain honorable uh, practitioners who are trying to keep things alive. I won't mention any names, but there are, there are some. Um, I, I think we have a, a worship of money, which is probably not a very good thing. And also we have a vast population and growing ever frighteningly so. And that in itself is, I think, going to be very, very difficult. One of the things that I think does have to happen is there has to be a complete change of ethos in schools of architecture. Or are schools of architecture necessary at all? Are they just places where people are indoctrinated to go on and do more of the same with even greater philosophy? I think that has to stop. I also think that the worship of star architects has to stop immediately. And that means that all the, the, the media reptiles also have to stop doing their stuff and building these people up as deities. That's idolatry. And idolatry is a great sin. And I'm not being an evangelist here at all. I mean, I'm just an old-fashioned an old chap who, who believes, I think, in common decency. And I don't I think see much of that in the money bags stuff that's going on today. Nor do I, thank you, nor, nor do I think it's fair on the youngsters to bully them into this thing. There, you probably noticed at the end of my slide of the, um, the cults, what, what describes the cults, down at the bottom there was a link to a disgusting film of a crit where a young woman was being mercilessly bullied by one of the so-called stars in the rudest, nastiest way possible. Somebody else was waving a paw. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, fine. I, I think I'll take you next, OK? One more. In Britain, is there widespread uh, appreciation or interest in uh, Poundbury? And uh, if so, uh, what is the general public opinion uh, and does public it contrast? It. The media hates it. Hate, hate it. The media reptiles are all out to take the party line, which is uh, A, anti Prince Charles, B, oh, it's pastiche, but they don't use the word properly because they don't know what it means. And uh, so they just want more of the same because these, the, 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 the journalists, the writers, and so on are all in cahoots with these leaders of a public opinion. Let me tell you a little story. Um, the, the editor of a so-called professional magazine uh, s sneered at my book, sneered at me, didn't address any of the issues that I raised, just it was an ad hominem abuse, that's all. And then he, this was followed by a series of tweets. Uh, he said, I, however, I could draw a little. Uh, so one of his uh, correspondents said, well, my hands should be smashed with sledgehammers then to stop me doing any more. That's the kind of fascism we've got. And it's disgusting. I sent a, 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 an article to a, a so-called respectable British magazine. I never even had an acknowledgment. I sent the same thing to a French magazine, had it accepted with gratitude in two days, and then I wrote and told the other chap what he could do with it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the insightful presentation. Um, playing off the last three questions, I'm curious of your opinion of the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission in England, and if you think that has, you know, a bright future ahead or no. not much? No, is there? Okay. And I'll tell you why. It, it caused an absolute out, uproar. The entire architectural profession started to scream about it and denounce Roger Scruton because he, he, he likes hunting, he's a conservative. Uh, he thinks modern, a lot, most of modern architecture is the work of charlatans. Uh, 
and has been has failed but you're not allowed to say that you have to go along with it so they don't like him and they wanted an architect to be appointed so they were out to get him and they were delighted to, to get rid of him. sort of celebratory articles champagne corks popping of course naturally and uh I think in, in, initially it was just window dressing. Uh, the government has now been very bad, shown up in a very poor light uh, because of the whole thing. Uh, poor old Scruton has had a dreadful time. I mean, he, he actually wrote a, a review of this book of mine saying that, you know, I've had a frightful bashing from the establishment, but I'm getting even worse. <laughs> That's what he wrote about himself. Um, However, I have, I have received the most wonderful support from Scandinavia, from certain perceptive British critics, but most especially from the New World, from Canada and the United States. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. Thank you very much. And, and perhaps, that might give us hope, because once you lot start doing something, all these idiots who've been squawking in England will change direction and join you, because their mentalities are those of the mob or a flock, ovine flocks. Anybody else? No, okay. But well, I'm very, very grateful to you all. Thank you very much.